Um, let us begin. Um, and many of you have already been to the previous lecture, so I won't give a introduction to our speaker in any great detail, other than, of course, to welcome him back to the fifth lecture in what have been um, tremendously engaging studies of Paul in the philosophical context. So, Professor Paul Noir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the fifth lecture is uh, entitled The Empire of Evil and the Overflow of Good. Where does evil from, come from? How can we explain that man can do something other than good? This question is an enigma that thought has tackled in many ways. Freud himself gave his formulation of the problem in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. If we think that all living beings seek pleasure and that it is this desire that guarantees the preservation and reproduction of life, some destructive behavior becomes incomprehensible. For example, why do humans hate? There is nothing in it that is beneficial to his own life. It can even destroy him. Hatred begins with the pleasure of destruction. It often ends with a self-destruction without pleasure. And yet, it happens that man hates. Freud, therefore, had to go beyond the, princi the pleasure principle, that is to say, to go beneath it and to reduce the role of desire among the drives. Thus, he had to recognize a, what he calls a more original duality between the tendencies of the soul that push towards death and those that tend to the continuation of life. Human life then appears as the result of these two forces, that which wants to maintain life, eros, the sexual drive, and radical hatred, later called Thanatos, which wants to destroy everything and reduce all that lives to an inanimate state. Freud himself recognizes that, that this dualistic explanation is speculative, even mythological, because, I quote, one is rarely impartial when it comes to the last things, end of quotation. So, Freud makes no secret in the fact that the division of man into opposing impulses is a matter of eschatology. This is why the biological explanation of death is not sufficient. According to this explanation, death is the characteristic of evolved beings, which must resort to sexuality in order to reproduce. But Freud considers that primitive peoples who ignore the idea of natural death and believe that it comes from, I quote, an enemy or an evil spirit, are saying something far reaching. We should go so far as to reject the biological explanation according to which desire is at the service of the perpetuation of the species and therefore death at the service of life. On the contrary, according to Freud, it should be argued that in man, hatred is older than love and that the finality of, the, of life is death. In this, Freud agrees with one of Schopenhauer's most pessimistic theses. So the question of evil is then coupled with the question of guilt. From, a, from an early age, we learn to feel guilt. But what are we guilty of? of this or that action, of all our actions, or even of existing? Are we accountable for our actions or are they the result of social pressure or even an illusion, the illusion of free will and responsibility? Guilt is one of the keys to Freudian psychoanalysis. For Freud, man feels fundamentally guilty. Making him feel guilty is the very work of culture. Because he is educated to feel guilty, man represses his barbaric impulses 
which makes life in society possible. But according to Freud, not only does man feel guilty, but he, is, he really is guilty. In Moses and monotheism, he considers that the concept of original sin, invented, so he says, by Paul, serve to crystallize this feeling of guilt. I, I quote, Paul has brought it correctly back to its, to its primitive historical source. Freud thus considers that formally the concept of original, or, of original sin is relevant. There really was a fault at the beginning of history. Our collective memory has repressed it, but we, we still feel the guilt. Paul was simply mistaken about its content. The primitive sin was not Adam's revolt, but the murder of the father. This is why, says Freud, Paul found a phantasmatic way out by inventing redemption by a son of God. It had to be the work of a son since the victim was a father. My purpose here is not to discuss Freud's new mythology on the origin of evil. I would simply like to examine the twofold question it poses. One, what is the origin of evil? Two, what is the origin of human guilt? I will deal first with the problem of guilt. Did Paul divert the universal sense of guilt for his own purposes? Did he develop a doctrine of original sin? Where does the concept of original sin actually come from? We will, we will have to go through Augustine's interpretation, which will allow us to approach the Paul I believe to be more authentic. That's what, that will be my first point. Having discarded simplistic and erroneous interpretations, we will then be able to return to Paul's question. For him, where does the origin of evil come from? Second point. And finally, we will see that evil is secondary. That is, it appears as such only from the superabundance of the divine gift, which absolutely exceeds all evil. So I come to my first point, point Augustine and original sin. If we want to understand why Paul has been seen as a theorist of original sin, we must read Augustine. For it is Augustine who formalized the concept of original sin. Against Manichaean dualism, for whom evil was being in the world, Augustine had established that evil is not a being, but that it comes from us, that it, it exists only through our action and for our will. But how could free will, which is the power to choose between several goods, choose evil? We cannot have recourse to a previous cause to a pre-existing evil nature. There is therefore in the will itself a, a fallibility, a defect, which comes from nothing, which comes from the nothingness in us. Augustine thus explains evil as a deficient cause, causa defectiva, an absence of cause, and not as a causa effectiva, an efficient cause. Already in the Ad Simplicianum, when he explains Romans 7, 18, in me, that is, in my flesh, dwells not the good, Augustine comments, what dwells in our flesh is sin. But where does sin come from? I quote, from the transmission of mortality and the habit of pleasure. And where do mortality and habit come from? Quotation, the first comes from the punishment of original sin, and the second from the punishment of sin frequently committed." End of quotation. We are born into the world with the fault of original sin, whose penalty is death, and we add to it a second fault, the habit of pleasure. For Augustine, the whole of human nature has been vitiated, I quote, true, Man's nature was primitively created without sin and without blemish. 
But this nature of man by which each one is born of Adam is now in need of a physician for it is no longer sound, end of quotation. The great break in human history was a transition from an uncorrupted nature as from the hands of the creator to our fallen nature as a result of the first transgression. And the agent of this break, the one who brought it about from the primitive state to our punitive state is Adam. Thus, Augustine hypostasized the drama of the fallible will in the first will, in Adam's will. From then on, the core of the story is no longer only the Messiah, but also Adam. He is the one who turns nature from a state of integrity to a state of corruption. The Adamic narrative already has the aim of transposing the experience of Israel's disobedience and exile to a symbolic place. And its meaning was to show that evil, evil did not come from the world, but from man. But by making Adam an individual out of us, and no longer the symbol of man drawn from clay, he forces us to think of the transmission from man to man, which passes through a biological scheme, heredity. But then Augustine reintroduces evil at the level of nature, which leads to the monstrous concept of natural sin, peccatum naturae. In his manual, Augustine sums up his doctrine as follows. Adam had vitiated in his, in his root the trunk of the human race. He thus imposed on his descendants a punishment which consists in death and damnation. From this original fall, and by a divine punishment, every man is born a sinner, condemned, and subject to concupiscence. He, in turn, begets in concupiscence. Therefore, every child born of a sexual act in turn contracts original sin. This is how Augustine explains the text of Romans 5.12 as, as he received it. I quote, through one man sin entered the world and through sin death. And so it, sin, so it passed into all men, in quo omnes peccaverunt, so, and in him, in quo, so in that man, all sinned. Man is mortal and damned from, from birth as a punishment for Adam's sin. Thus, death has passed into all mankind. But why does humanity suffer punishment for a crime it has not committed. This is because mankind committed evil in Adam. Men are bound together in this fault because they were already present in him and thus share in his responsibility. Even if it is older, this interpretation of the origin of evil is a key part of Augustine's struggle against the Pelagians. If man is born damned, inclined to evil, he cannot produce good works by himself. He cannot merit salvation. And so he needs grace, not to crown his good works, as the Pelagians say, but from the beginning to will them, even before fulfilling them. The Augustinian analysis is based on the dialectic of law and grace and on the, an association between the weakness of the will, Romans 7, and original sin, Romans 5. The Pelagians emphasize that the Augustinian reading of Romans 5 is wrong. According to Paul, man is born mortal, not sinful. They are attached to the great tradition of free will, which goes from origin to the first Augustine, which bases man's responsibility on his capacity to sin or not to sin against all dualisms. For the Pelagians, Augustine falls back into Manichaeism. For him, man is born in an evil mode, he is evil from birth, and his nature is corrupted. 
I think that in reality, if Augustine recovers some of the consequences of dualism, it is from another principle. It is because freedom of the will cannot be its own foundation, that it collapses on itself and opens up into the abyss of evil. For Augustine, but against Paul, powerlessness is universal. It is because every man is born subject to lust that his will is powerless and that he needs grace. But the weakness of the will and the strength of concupiscence are themselves the result of original sin. Only this concept makes it possible to explain why human nature, while being created good, has become evil. That is, why the covetousness of the flesh always struggles in us against the spirit. The Augustinian interpretation of original sin has, has had a long legacy in the Latin church, even if not all accepted its radicality. But the Greek fathers did not adhere to it for a good reason. This interpretation is based on Paul's translation by the Vetus Latina. The first part does not pose any problems, just as through one man sin entered the world and through guilt death, but the second part is more obscure, and that thus death has passed to all men, F. Ho Pontes Hemarton. I translate, and in this, um, this is how I provisionally translate F. Ho, and in this, all have sinned. For complex historical reasons, the Latin text has become <coughs> in quo omnes peccaverunt. What can understand in quo in two ways, and in that, as in Greek, or quite simply, in whom, in whom they all um, uh, sinned. But in the, later, in the latter case, in quo can only refer to sin, death being in the feminine in Latin. In Greek, however, it is the other way around. Fho can only refer to death, sanatos, which is masculine, and not to sin, hamartia, which is feminine. Thus, there are two readings of this text. The Greek reading, origin explains, by this lapidary formula, the apostle affirms that the death that came from sin has passed into all men, in that in Eoku, all have sinned. Cyril of Alexandria underlines that from the fault of Adam, mortality entered into human nature, so it is death which was transmitted to each individual. It is in a way deserved by the force that each one commits in his turn. And we have the other reading, Augustine's reading. <clears throat> he understands the sin of Adam in which all have sinned. The meaning then becomes, and so sin passed into all men and in him, Adam, all sinned. In Adam's sin, all, make, all men took part. Therefore, they are all guilty. As in Paul's Greek, Greeks, as in Paul's Greek text, one man brought about sin and death. But whereas in Greek it is death that has passed to other men, in Latin it seems to be sin. Moreover, all have sinned in this one man. All have sinned because Adam is not only an individual, but also the whole of humanity. He bears in germ, in him, all men. Because they were already in Adam, all, mare, all men are in solidarity with the first fault. They committed it with him. They are transcendentally guilty. Their punishment, death, is therefore just. Augustine's two key theses are the hereditary transmission of sin and a justification. Because all men sinned in Adam, they deserved it. But these are misinterpretations of Paul. Of course, the concept of original sin, sin is perfectly consistent with the text Augustine read. 
This was one of the reasons for his disagreement with Pelagius, who argued instead that Adam's fault did not cause sin in others because sin implies free will. But this concept of original sin is contradictory. It comes up against the ambiguity of all, any origin to designate both a beginning in the will and a transmission by nature. How can a beginning govern all history? If the whole continuation is, is contained in the beginning, how is the responsibility of all contained in the sin of one? If sin is hereditary, his man held guilty and punished for a crime he has not committed. In German, original sin is called Erbsünde, hereditary sin. But this aspect of the concept falls under the criticism of Kant in Religion Within the Limits of Simple Reason, I quote. Whatever the origin of moral evil in man, the most inadequate of all the ways of representing the diffusion and continuation of it consists in representing it as having come from our first parents by heredity. Only the concept of a free beginning within the, new, the human will can be authentic. This is how the problem is raised, is raised for Augustine. But is this how it was raised for Paul? I come to my second point, Paul and the origin of evil, Romans 5.12. How does Paul understand the origin, the, the history of evil among men? The Pauline reflection on the origin of evil is not philosophical in nature. It is expressed in a symbolic mode, more archaic and deeper than concepts which goes back beyond the principle of contradiction. We are obliged to have recourse to it each time we try to think the origin, since we go where reality escapes the concept and escapes the possible experience. And if I quoted Freud, it is to remind us that any speculation on the origins is necessarily the deciphering of a symbol. Thus, it is possible to think that Paul's logos is no less profound, no less rational than Freud's. The first meaning of this account of origins is to tell a truth that goes beyond the concept of free will as well as its opposite, that of slave will. For man, evil is, already, is always already there. Man is a sinner, he begins his own sin, but he comes into a world already marked by sin. Paradox paradoxically, sin begins with him, but it had already begun before him. Let us take a closer look at the text of Romans 5. In this chapter, Paul gives a brief history of humanity in 10 verses. But let us emphasize beforehand, this history is read only from the point of view of the overflow of good. Paul describes the consequences of the salvation brought by the Messiah. His generosity was to give not for the righteous and the disciples, but for the unrighteous and the enemies. He thus reconciled the people to God, and it is from this positive act that we can measure the depth of evil that, has, that have been abolished. Paul's text is cleverly constructed. First, there is a comparison that breaks its momentum. Um, 5.12, just as through one man, sin entered the world, etc., which awaits an equivalent compensation. Then, there is the double negation of any comparison, but it is not the same for the sin as for the gift, 5.15. It is not the same for what happens through one who sins and for the gift, 5.16. And finally, there is the conclusion of the reasoning with the return of the comparison, 
80. So then, just as through the sin of one came condemnation for all men, so through the work of righteousness of one came justification, which gives life for all men. Thus, Paul first sketches a comparison between man's fault and the justification of the Messiah. Then he denies it. And finally, he takes it up again, but in a transcendent mode. So we must distinguish three stages in human history. One, humanity before the grace of the Messiah, evil entered the world. Two, the superabundance of good that came from the Messiah. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace reign in life through Jesus the Messiah alone. And three, in conclusion, Paul will compare the excess of the gift brought, brought about by the Messiah to the loss suffered by men. Let us focus on the first moment. When we ask, how did evil enter the world? We know that world means man as he exists in the oblivion of God. But what does enter mean? Is it a beginning in time? Or is it a principle essential to all humanity? But then, must we pose an anti-God, a principle of evil, opposite God, the principle of good? Is dualism conceptually sustainable? In verse 12, we find four propositions. One, as through Hosper, as through one man, guilt entered into the world. Two, and through guilt, death. Three, and so death passed into all men. Four, fo pontes emarton, whereupon they all trespassed. What Paul says is obscure, and we have to unravel it. As Origen has already seen, this passage is an, is an anacolothon, since the comparison has no second term. It is up to the reader to reconstitute the reasoning from what follows. Just as through one man, evil entered the world and death followed. So also, I quote, um, I quote Origen completing the sentence. So, uh, so also through one man, righteousness entered the world and through righteousness, life. And so life passed into all men, end of quotation. Why this broken construction? Origen's explanation is interesting. It is that by leaving the reader in suspense, waiting for the next part of the statement, Paul is making it clear to the reader that the future is not taken for granted and that he must not relax. I quote uh, Origen, if it is true that righteousness will enter this world through one man, he implies that it will not happen immediately in the present time and that it will not be given to the lazy. So even after the messianic reconcil reconciliation, man's life remains oriented towards the future. Three difficulties remain. First one, does Paul maintain that every sin deserves punishment and that our punishment is death. Second one, what is the relationship between the first sin, which is mortal in the literal sense, and the sins of all? Third question, what is the relationship between sin and death? So I come to the first question, is death a punishment for sin? In verse 12, Paul says that sin entered through one man. This is obviously Adam. Eve does not need to be mentioned, since the whole reasoning is based on a comparison between two persons, the first and the last man, Adam and the Messiah. Evil enters through him. Man here is not a complement of an agent. He has a role of an intermediary. Uh, the, the dia found in DL10, death has passed. He is rather a transmitter. Sin enters, it passes through him, 
But where does it come from? From the one who enters the world, sin personified. But then who is responsible for the evil? The one who fulfills the action, sin itself as such personified and not the, and not the man through whom it passes. So from the beginning, sin entered the world through the first man and with him death passed through the breach. What does this statement mean? Augustine considers that the Pelagian interpretation leads to an unacceptable position. When Julian shows and rightly shows him that the meaning of verse 12 is all have sinned in this death, Augustine rejects this interpretation. He retains the antecedent, homo, the man, which he explains. Because all were in that man at the time he sinned. Indeed, the right reading of the Pelagians seems to him absurd. In what way would physical death be the origin of the fault? I quote Augustine. How can this be understood? I do not see it at all. For men die in sin, they do not sin in death. For sin having preceded, death follows. But if death precedes, sin does not follow. End of quotation. Moreover, if what is passed on is death and not the fault, the fate of man is unjust. They, I quote Augustine, they state that the penalty is passed on without the fault and that innocent little, one, little ones are struck with an unjust punishment since they incur death without having deserved death. End of quotation. Is not guilty. For God to be for God to be just in inflicting death on man, we must therefore man must therefore be guilty simply by being born. So in thinking that he is only responding to the Pelagians, Augustine highlights a central difficulty in Paul's thought. If what is transmitted is death, why do men pass from death to sin? Sin entered. What time are we close? Uh, sorry. Sorry. Mm -hmm. sorry. No, we have to close. Yeah. Into that. Sin entered, and through dia again, uh, and through sin, death. Can death be a punishment? It seems so. For Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But would Paul not know that animals that do not sin perish? Here, we must clearly distinguish human death from the corruptibility of living beings. Animals perish, they do not die. Moreover, death is not one of the three punishments described in Genesis, sweat, toil, and pain. According to the Book of Wisdom, the real origin of death is not God, but his adversary, Diabolos, from the Greek diabolain, to throw oneself in the way to divert, to divide, to defame. Diabolos, in Hebrew, the Satan, is the adversary. So, uh, according to Wisdom 2.24, by the envy of the devil, death entered the world. Paul uses the same expression, but precisely he applies it to sin. It is not God who sends death. If God is God, he has no idea of evil. Death is therefore not a punishment from God, but a punishment that man inflicts on himself. Wisdom 116, the ungodly call for, call for death with their words and their hands. But first, if death is not a punishment, by saying that it comes through sin, does Paul mean that death is its inelectable consequence? No, Paul means above all that the desire for evil is a desire for death. Romans 6.21, what fruit did you have then? Things whose end is death. 
We must go even further. Death is the other face of sin. For death is universal, predating even Moses. Romans 5.14, death reigned from Adam until Moses. Likewise, guilt is prior to the law, which makes it imputable. Romans 5.13, until the law, guilt was in the world, but guilt is not imputed when there is no law. Adam was not the only one to sin. All did so after him, even without the law. From the first man onwards, evil reigned, but it was not imputed as evil. From Moses onwards, evil is manifested and imputed by the law, but it is not cured. Sin, therefore, is another name for the adversary. It enters the world, it passes through generations, it reigns over men. Therefore, it makes no sense to ask what would have happened if man had not sinned. Nietzsche said it well, this account of origins is intended to explain the present state of humanity, das wirkliche Leben. Every man is a slave to death and sin. But one is not the effect or punishment of the other. They are the two sides, the obverse and the reverse, of the power that rules over human existence subject to the world. The reign of death will be called the reign of sin when the law reveals its true nature. Paul seeks to explain that every man is born mortal and does evil, and that his guilt is revealed when the law appears. But he does not claim that he is born guilty. At this archetypal level, the Augustinian problematic of free will does not apply. Before the law, there is no imputation. Paul says so explicitly. Nor is there any justice that would be restored by a punishment. This is not fatalism, however, because each man, by his own fault, contributes to the invasion of evil in the world, and from the law onwards, he must give an account of it. If, quote, all have sinned, it is in their action rather than an hereditary blemish. And yet, the Pauline narrative tries to say, in a symbolic way, that the con what the concept fails to grasp. Even if each one sins by himself, evil has a collective dimension. Since there is a unity in salvation, there is a solidarity in guilt. In good as in evil, one cannot conceive of men as, as separate individuals who would not be affected by the freedom of others. Here, we have one half of the concept of original sin, the description of a beginning of evil, but we do not have the other half, that is, the idea that the fault is hereditary, that it condemns all humanity to be born guilty. Let us turn to our second question. What is the relationship between the first fault and the faults of all? In the Judean tradition, the first sin and the origin of violence is the murder of Abel by Cain. <clears throat> Adam was unaware of murder, even the murder of animals, since he was a vegetarian. Now the archetype of death, the first death, that contains them all is the murder of the brother and, and not the father, as Freud says. <clears throat> In this thought that Freud calls primitive, death implies murder. The, the one who kills destroys what is more essential to him than himself, others, his brother. Thus, he destroys himself, homicide, reveals itself as suicide. By killing the other, man enters into death. He lives in death. In so far as, as he is a being in the world, man is a being in death. The idea of sin being born with Adam is well documented in the first century um, of our era uh, 
in the fourth book of Ezra. I quote, For it was the evil hurt that first caused Adam to disobey, and he was overcome, and all his offspring with him. Adam was the first to be defeated by the forces of evil. It was not just a mistake followed by many others. It was a defeat for all humanity. But where did this first disobedience come from? I quote once more uh, the, the fourth book of Ezra. A seed of evil was sown from the beginning in the heart of Adam. How many sins has it not produced up to now? And how many will it not produce until the time of harvest? So the same seed of evil desire is present in all men. In Adam, it produced the first sin, but it does not cease to produce it in all the others. If mortality is inherited from the first man, the same cannot be said for guilt. It is related to Adam's in the mode of imitation. Paul speaks of those who, 514, I quote, who have not sinned in the likeness, epito homo yomati, of Adam's transgression. So it's a question of uh, likeness. This resemblance is obviously not a mere coincidence in evil. It means that others, in turn, imitate the first transgression. They repeat it, that is, they ratify it by reproducing it. It is not it is therefore not necessary to bring, to bring in the idea of a hereditary transmission. For even if it is first manifested in the first man, the power of the evil heart concerns every man. I quote um, um, once more uh, the book of Ezra, Ezra. This plague was perpetuated. The law met the root of evil in the hearts of the people. Thus, the good disappeared and evil remained. This book of Ezra represents good and evil as two antagonistic forces. The seed of evil on the one hand, the law that wants to bear fruit on the other. This does not imply that they are equal, for they are not on the, of the same order. Time and again, and from the beginning, it is the forces of evil that have prevailed despite some outbursts of the good. The book of Ezra does not make Adam responsible for the faults of his descendants. It only dramatizes the history of evil in humanity by personifying it. I quote, O oh you, Adam, what have you done? For if you have sinned, your fault was not yours alone, but also ours, your offspring. Adam represents human sinfulness, which is personified in him. The second book of Baruch made it, makes this clear. Adam was a cause for himself alone, but each of us for himself became Adam. Here, as in Paul, evil is linked to death. I quote, what good is the promise of eternal time to us? if we have done works that bring death. This text sheds light on two points. One, it is us who do evil and we cannot pass it off on Adam. Two, there is an intrinsic link between evil and death. But who sowed this evil seed, if not the adversary, the diabolos? According to Paul, Evil is personified, is a personified power which rules over man. 6.12. For Paul, man, man is not an individual with free will. Certainly, just afterwards, Paul will exhort his addressees to serve God and not evil, which means that man has the possibility to choose. But this is not a subjection of free will. It is an option between two servitudes. Let's come to our third question. What is the relationship 
between sin and death. First of all, the death of all men is not a punishment for someone else's fault. It is not undergone as a fatality because it is of their making. They must each time assume the consequences of their own faults. Secondly, we know that evil is a force that drives men away from God and from all good things, starting with life. The power of evil governs human existence and penetrates life. It rules over all men, it sows the seed of evil in them and holds them captive under its yoke. It is about this issue that Paul says, Romans 7, 24, I see another law in my members which struggles against the law of my mind and holds me captive to the law of sin. How does one go from death to sin? Should we see death as the seed and sin as its fruit? A later text from the epistle to the Hebrews can help us to understand. I quote 2.15, the Messiah frees all those who, by fear of death, were in all their life held in servitude. So the logic is this. The reign of death holds men captive to evil because the fear of being killed makes them murderers. Hobbes will remember this. Death blackmails man. As long as he lives in the anxiety of his being in death, he does evil. Therefore, according to this epistle, the Messiah has, I quote uh, 2.14, the Messiah has deactivated him who has the, the reign of death, that is, the devil. The devil makes death rule. It is the war of all against all which Hobbes will describe, man is a wolf to man. Thus, in man, there is both life and death. In him, death works, death fights. And only, who, and only he who lives in expectation of the Messiah opens himself to another form of life, a life which does not lead to death. He is freed and capable of good. One must wait for the resurrection and the eschatological advent of the Messiah to become capable of no longer doing evil. Now we can resume our reading of Romans 5. The first part of Paul's reasoning on the origin of evil can only be explained from the second part on the superabundance of good. Paul project is to highlight the universal salvation fulfilled by the Messiah by opposing it to the reign of death and evil, which has prevailed since Adam. Evil must be thought from the event of the Messiah. I quote, he died for our faults, 1 Corinthians 15, huper ton hamarton hemon, not just because of them, but in view of them. But how can the act of one qualify for all? The figure of Adam is meant to answer this question. Adam is typos to melontos, the type of the one who is about to come, 514. That is, the type of the Messiah. The Vulgate nicely says, forma futuri, the form of the one who will be. We are here at the heart of the temporality of imminence. We must not think of Adam as a figure of our past, but as a figure of our future. Adam is above all, the figure of the eschaton, of the end of times happening in Jesus Messiah. It is only indirectly that he is its origin. Only the eschatological situation reveals the Adamic situation. Fault can only be thought of from the gratuitous eruption of the good and not vice versa.
This is why the Old Testament does not refer to Adam as an, an, ex, as an explanatory principle of later history. A New Testament was needed for this. Adam is a beginning arche, and he is a figure to pawn. He is an archetype. He is the figure of the Messiah, but an inverted figure. He is a figure because he stands for all humanity, just as from the single and unique Messiah comes grace, so too from the single and unique Adam comes evil. But the inverted figure, what matters is the overflow of goodness that comes from the Messiah. Adam is only the negative of that. The key to the problem of the origin of evil is the unity of all men in the Messiah. The Messiah is not one more individual who would come at the end of human history, but he is the unity of this history, the unity of this humanity. The Messiah saves all sinful humanity, thus he establishes a solidarity in grace. But this one reveals, a contrario, the complicity of man in evil. Similarly, it is solidarity in messianic life, in the life that does not lead to death, that reveals solidarity in death. I quote 1 Corinthians 15. As well as in Adam all die, in the Messiah all will be vivified. The Messiah is not only living and life-giving, but he himself has passed through death and murder and thus revealed their sec secret unity. Paul in universalism is based on the unity of humanity, but it is a messianic unity. Evil does not bring about the unity of humanity, but its division. Only reconciliation in the Messiah brings together all men who clash. It turns the division between all men into unity in Adam. The Messiah reconciles men, men to God, Romans 5.10. And so he reconciles them to each other. If all have done evil, it is through the transmission of murderous violence, through an anguish before death that pushes each man to cut himself off from the other and to become a murderer in his turn, and not through the hereditary transmission of an individual sin of the first man. One might object that such a reflection on the origin of evil is mythological and not philosophical. But I would reply that mythos means, first of all, narrative. This narrative thinks, and it sometimes thinks better than the concept. Moreover, a narrative is required whenever it is a question of thinking about the origin, where reality escapes the grasp of experience and concept. And if I quoted Freud in the introduction, it is to remind us that any speculation on origins is necessarily narrative and therefore mythological. Thus, Paul's logos is arguably no less profound or rational than Freud's. I come to my third and last point, the overflow of the good. The universal abundance of evil is answered by the superabundant gift of the good. 520, where fault was full, grace overflowed, uh, grace over overflowed, hyper perisocen, hyper perisocen. We are in an economy of excess and even of gratuitous over excess. Hence, the conclusion of the argument. The gift of grace is not symmetrical to the fault. It not only compensates for it, but it is also infinitely greater. However great the resemblance between Adam and the Messiah, the dissimilarity is even greater. <laughs> 
I quote 515, the graceful gift is not like the fall. For if by the fault of one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gracious gift of one man, Jesus the Messiah, overflow to the many. I think we are approaching the heart of the enigma. Grace, charis, divine favor, the gratuitous gift. It is this gift which is accessible to Judeans and Gentiles, this gift that makes humanity. This gift that man lives by while awaiting the Messiah. Man is justified freely by God according to mercy and not according to the law. Evil has been in full swing, but grace overflows even more in overdrive compare compared to the fulfillment of the fault. Certainly, the gift comes to repair the loss, but it goes far beyond simple symmetry. If the fault of the one led all men to their ruin, the grace that makes them just overflows towards the many, towards humanity that has multiplied its faults. The superabundance of the life given covers the overflow of death. In other words, it is only from the fullness of the gift that we can think of evil and as its shadow. The complicity of man in guilt does not appear in itself, but only as the reverse side of the solidarity of all men justified in the fourth. Men are divided. They are united only in the Messiah. We are not in a problematic of free will where a man would ask why he must pay for the free act of another. There is a, no, a common origin of evil only revealed by the unity of humanity in the Messiah. It is because man needs justification that he reveals himself as a sinner, not the other way round. The principle of justification cannot be the self, since no man can cancel his intrinsic deficiency any more than he can discharge his own debt. On the other hand, the messianic as such does not sin. Good conduct is not the basis of justification. On the contrary, justification is the basis of good conduct. How do we situate the law in this economy of giving? Paul says that the law appears laterally. Nomos de pareselten, the law has intervened. While evil has entered, aselten, the world, and death has passed, dielten, through men, the law comes laterally from the side, from the side in the meantime, pareselten. So, the law has a function of lateral consolidation. But Paul adds, the law intervened so that Hina, the fault, might abound. 520. But how are we to understand this Hina, so that? Is it a trick of divine providence which gave the law to lock man further into evil? so that he would implore grace and it would abound. This is Luther's interpretation. If it were the case, Paul would have to state that, that the law is evil, but he maintains the opposite. In reality, it is a rereading of history after the fact, an interpretation that starts from the only possible center, the Messiah. Just as our failures make sense from our later successes, from the point of view of grace, everything makes sense, including the fault. Man is revealed as a sinner insofar as, it, as he needs justification. It is the fullness of the new life that reveals the failure of the previous life, not the other way round. If we bring chapter five closer to uh, chapter seven, we understand that Paul 
is not a thinker of the man paralyzed by evil, plunged into powerlessness of the will as a result of original sin. Augustine attributed the impossibility of being virtuous to man's native guilt, the consequence of which is the rebellion of concupiscence by which he no longer obeys his free will. It was therefore necessary to will the good in order to be free, but in order to become able to, of willing the good, one had to receive grace. Paul's analysis is much more radical. There is nothing in our free will that can free man. Nothing in us that can free man. His aim is to maintain both that the law, the law is holy because God's promise are without repentance, and, uh, <clears throat> but that it does not justify because it does not allow man to fulfill it. Man cannot free himself. He must be freed by another. As he received his servitude from another, the adversary, so he receives his freedom from another, the Messiah. By this, Paul does not seek to lock each man in his guilt, but on the contrary, to make him understand that he is delivered from the project of saving himself, a project doomed to failure. The Messiah has done it, has done it for him. Now, this analysis has an undeniable philosophical dimension. It allows us to understand that ethics is based on an event from elsewhere and not on, and not on what Paul himself calls autonomy. It is through a gift unthinkable beforehand that man is given back to himself. Freedom does not come from our will, but from a primary otherness. I come to my conclusion. We can now conclude our reading of the epistle to the Romans. First of all, Paul does not claim that man is born guilty. He does not develop a doctrine of original sin in the strict sense of the term as the hereditary transmission of guilt. It was Augustine who transposed Paul's theology of history into a metaphysics of free will and individual guilt, which eventually led to a doctrine of predestination. The irony of this story is worth noting in passing. If Freud believed in original sin, Paul did not. Instead, Paul deploys a meditation on the repetition of sin. Every man inherits mortality, but he transforms it into sin because of his anguish of being mortal. He becomes a murderer for fear of being killed. If we try to embrace the arc of the last two lessons and conclude the analysis of chapters 3, 5, and 7 of Romans, we see that they do not verify Nietzsche's interpretation that Paul is preaching a disgospel, the bad news. First, Romans 7 is not an autobiographical analysis of the powerlessness of the will, but a reminder of what happens to man under the yoke of the law. Paul points out that man is irresistibly inclined to evil. But even in this evil, he agrees with the law that it is good, 7.16. This is therefore a justification of the validity of the law for the Judean people to whom it applies. But it is also reciprocally a reminder that the one who welcomes the, the event of the Messiah is free from both evil and from the law. The law of the spirit of life in the Messiah Jesus has freed you from the law of sin and death. Um, Romans 8, 2. Second point, Romans 5 is not a description of humanity inheriting the guilt of the first man, but 
evil cannot and should not be seen in itself. It must be seen in the perspective of the abundance of good, of the messianic event whose light accuses the shadows. All the recollection of the origins is intended to show that where guilt abounds, the gift of the Messiah, of the Messiah overflows. Among the shadows is the fact that sinful man has become both mortal and murderer. Mortal because the fear of dying has made him a murderer. He therefore grows up in a world already marked by a desire for death of which he becomes an accomplice. Third point, Romans 3 states that man is justified by faith. On the one hand, both Judeans and Greeks are subject to evil. The Judean is convicted of sin by the law of God, whose circumcision reminds him that he belongs to it. On the other hand, the Gentile, the uncircumcised, is also without excuse. He is for himself the law, and he proves incapable of fulfilling its prescriptions because he has himself because he has given himself over to idolatry and lust therefore since both do evil both deserve the press and the anguish first the judeans then the greeks this is the reverse side of this phenomenon but there is a front side on this other side, God's justice has been manifested and all can obtain it by faith, whether they are Greeks or Judeans. Through faith, God justifies the circumcised and the uncircumcised. We are no longer under the law since God's justice is manifested by faith without the law, but this does not mean that the law would be deactivated ceasing to be valid for the Judean people, but on the contrary, that we establish it. We renew it by fulfilling it, that is to say, by bringing it beyond itself. If the concept of original sin has a meaning, it is only insofar as this origin assigns the beginning of the fall to each of us, and not insofar as it is inherited. We must interrogate it in the direction of its source, that is to say, in the history of Adam, which it indicates, and not in its consequences downstream by submitting to the metaphysical drive, which makes us fall back into dualistic speculation or theodicy and give an ontological reality to evil. We should question it as an existential question and more as a reality to be fought than as a problem to be solved. All this analysis confirms Ricoeur's three main, main theses on original sin. First thesis, it makes no sense to speculate on the concept of original sin as if it had a consistency of its own. It should not be used to, blaze, to blame someone else for the sin, but it should direct our thinking towards deciphering the account of the first fault in Adam. Second conclusion of Ricoeur, it makes no sense to speculate on the evil, on the evil that is already there outside the evil that we do. We begin the evil again, but at the same time, we begin it ourselves, for although free, we inevitably commit it. Third conclusion, and last, it makes no sense to speculate about the evil we begin or the evil we find without reference to the history of salvation. The empire of evil is only the negative of the superabundance of good. Thank you very much.